and my hope is that by this point in the show, we're not what you thought we were. Look, I'm very aware some of you might have been dragged here by your parents. Um, maybe you're dragged here by your youth group. Might not have been the situation you wanted tonight, but you're here. And as we just displayed some of our scars, some of the things we don't like about ourselves, some of our past mistakes, I hope that you feel welcomed. I hope that you feel accepted. Because nobody on this stage here tonight is here to condemn you or to judge you, but to inspire and encourage. And so with that, um, I get the distinct privilege of really coming out here and really breaking down why we've actually made this decision. Um, why we put on these rings and said, I'm going to wait until I'm married to have sex. And look, by this point in the show, I think there's a lot of wisdom displayed in, in waiting, right? I mean, there are consequences. There are physical, medical, emotional consequences to not waiting. But if I'm being real with you, that's not why I'm here. That's not why I have a passion to talk to teens about how this decision has impacted my life. And so if I can just get as authentic as possible and to break it down to simplicity, guys, it's, it's this simple. We do this, we've made this decision in our lives because it's what God asks of every human being he's created. Right? God. Creator of every single thing, created everything with a purpose and a design. Sex, designed for one man, one woman in the context of marriage, so anything outside of that design doesn't fulfill its purpose. It's kind of like my iPhone. It's designed really well and has a purpose, right? It does its purpose really well. It shoots text, email, Snapchat, Instagram, whatever you want to do with it, it does it very well. That's because it was designed well. But what happens when I, the user, say, you know, I don't want to talk on my phone the normal. I'm going to flip it upside down and talk on my phone. What happens when I say, you know, I don't like that. I wish there were more physical buttons on my touchscreen smartphone, and I want, I want buttons. It's my phone. I get to do whatever I want with it. But who's being foolish? Guys, as the user, I don't get to say what the design of something is. It's up to the creator. Just like sex, guys, we're all users. None of us created it. God did, ultimately for our joy and his glory. And so we don't get to tell him, hey, no, the design is this, or the purpose is fulfilled here. You know, the verse on the ring um, that we all wear is 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 4. What it says is this. It is God's will. That you would be sanctified. Notice, it doesn't say God's recommendation, God's hope for your life. No, no, God's will for your life is that you be sanctified, set apart. That you abstain from sexual immorality and learn to control your bodies in a way that is holy and honorable. Guys, that's why we've made this decision. But look, I'm human too. I know that what I just said is <laughs> difficult, and I know what I just said ain't nobody doing. And so you might be sitting here thinking, yeah, no, Lou, this sounds great. I would love to be obedient to God in every minute, but dude, I don't think I can. It's like no one else is doing this. I feel like it is physically impossible to actually follow God on this one, and I don't know what to do. Well, look, I'm the youngest of six kids. So my entire life, I've always looked to people before me, looked to my siblings before me to kind of show me the ropes. How am I supposed to live life? And so, if we're sitting here tonight wondering, man, I would love to be obedient to God, but I don't know how, I think it'd be very wise of us to look to the people before us. Look to the people that have been obedient to God, and let's follow their example. All right, so with that, I want to turn to a story of a man named Abraham. Now look, I'm aware we're in a church, and everybody that's been in church knows who Abraham is, right? We've all heard the story. Father Abraham, and then his sons. And the sons had father Abraham. All the VBS students are like, I am one of them. So are you. <laughs> we know who you are, don't worry. Talk about that guy, Abraham. And at this point in the story, he's really, really old, all right? Like crazy old. Um, and you know, God shows up in his life. He's like, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And Abraham's like, yeah, no, that'd be really cool. Uh, but my wife can't produce a child, so I don't know how that's going to work. And God's like, yeah, I'm God. I can do something about it. Uh, and he does, right? He miraculously provides Abraham and Sarah a son, and they name him Isaac. And they are so excited because they've always wanted this son. 
But look, I'm not going to glance past this. They are crazy old. Like, he's 100 years old, she's 99 years old. Like, you guys think Bernie Sanders is old. Like, not a chance. Like, for real, just close your eyes right now. Think about your grandparents having a kid right now. No, 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 I said having a kid, not making a kid, you nasty. <laughs> this girl up here has got her eyes closed. She's like, yeah, that's good. No. It's disgusting. Wow. Anyway, so, finally had this kid. They're so excited because he's always one of Man, Abraham loves his son Isaac more than anybody else on this earth. But this is where I want to pick up the story. This is in Genesis 22. And God is speaking to Abraham again. And he's, saying, he's speaking directly to him. He says this. Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, dude, that seems crazy. Like, that seems really messed up. Yeah. It does seem crazy. It does seem really messed up. This is the only time in the Bible God has ever asked me to do something like this. But see, what's even more crazy is verse 3, which is directly after verse 2, which is this. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. You want to take bets on the most awkward walk of your life? Think, like, Dad, where are we going? On a trip. <laughs> In our favorite rocket ship. <laughs> it's the same BBS students I know. No, for real, we don't know. The Bible doesn't disclose how old uh, Isaac is, but we're assuming he's a, he's a boy, right? And so you know midway through that journey, Isaac's like, Dad, are we there yet? He's like, no, Isaac, we're not there yet. Keep walking. A couple more hours pass. Dad, are we there yet? No, Isaac, we're not there yet. Just keep walking. Dad, are we there yet? Dad, are we there yet? Dad, are we there yet? Isaac, Isaac, I swear to God of this universe, Ask me there yet one more time. I'm going to kill. <laughs> just, just keep walking, son. Keep playing on your iPad. Let's go. Take your time. So they keep walking. Finally, they get to the bottom of this mountain. And at this point, Abraham looks to the other two guys and says, "Hey, you two, stay back. My son Isaac and I. We're going to the top of this mountain. We're going to worship God. And when we're both done, we're coming back to you." And so it starts a very lonely trek of a father and a son up a mountain. But you know, as they're on their way up there, Isaac's looking around. He's a boy, but he's not stupid. He's looking around. He's like, man, things ain't lining up. And he starts pleading with his dad. He's like, dad, um, I don't get how this is going to work. I see the wood for the altar we got to create. I'm carrying that on my back. I see the flame. I see the knife. You got that in your hands. But where's the sacrifice? Like, Dad, every time we do something like this, every time we we, start, we gotta have an animal, we don't have any of this, what are we gonna do up there? And in verse 8, Abraham looks to his son and says this, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And they keep walking. Finally, he gets to the top of this mountain, and Abraham is faced with a decision he never thought he'd have to make. As he literally looks into the eyes of a son he loves more than anybody else on this earth, he decides to bind him up and lay him on a wooden altar that his son carried to the top of that mountain and is seconds away from committing the most vicious act he ever thought possible. All because God told him to do it, right? He's got a knife stretched out. Looking into the eyes of the son he loves more than anybody else. But out of nowhere, in verse 11 and 12, it says, An angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And it says the substitute was provided. It actually says there's a ram caught in thorn bushes that just appeared. Um, I think that's actually hilarious. I mean, I got a sick sense of humor, but like... The ram wasn't there. Like, you catch me tracking with me? Like, God's just up there, like, playing this cosmic game of Pokemon Go. He's like, Ram, it's you. I choose you. It just, a ram just appears. And you gotta feel bad for this thing, because you know it's elsewhere prior. I mean, it's out in the middle of a field, not caring about a ram thing, and then all of a sudden, God's like, I need you elsewhere. And some creepy old guy's like, come here, boy, and just, like, stabs him. Like, for real, think, think of the ramifications of this story. That was only for some of you. 
So it actually says that Isaac was saved by this ram. And so Isaac's life um, literally was saved and then they sacrificed this ram. And so you're probably sitting here thinking, what in the world are we talking about? Lou, I thought we were talking about sex. And look, based off of what I told you in that story, if you're thinking of sex, we got a whole other issue. We can talk about that after the show, but that's not what we're talking about. No, so what's the point? So look, God never intended on taking Isaac. God, creator of everything, is outside of time, knows everything before it even happens because time doesn't exist in him. He's not surprised by the outcome of this. It's Abraham that didn't know. And see, God wanted Abraham to trust him. But he wanted him to trust him for the right reasons. He wanted Abraham to realize who, in fact, he was trusting. And so my point in telling a story like this tonight is because what can happen with events like these is we can come here, live our Christian lives in here. God wants me to wait until I'm married to have sex. And God is the only one that can damn me to hell, so I guess I'll listen. And that's not it. The point here isn't mere submission. See, Abraham trusted God because he knew God, had a relationship with with God. And so when God asked Abraham to do something so crazy, something so outlandish, something nobody else would be willing to do, Abraham knew to trust God's character more than the circumstance he was in. See, what I, what, what I find so fascinating about this story is his obedience. Because, man, if we're going to define the word obedience, it's textbook form right here. It's what? It was immediate. God says, go, and he gets up the next morning and does it. Secondly, it was constant. Man, this wasn't a rash decision. It took me three minutes to get to the top of that mountain. And finally, it was unwavering. Not at one point did he look at God and shake his fist and say, God, how could you ask me to do something like this? No, he just says, God, you're God. I'm not. Your ways are hard. And I'm going to follow suit. That's obedience. And so before I get off the stage and look, somebody else comes up and talks to you, what I would love to do right now is just, as a Christian, I would love to just sort out some family business real quick. And so look, if you're not a Christian, please don't think I'm saying this isn't for you. No, listen up. We can all learn from this, I promise you. But as Christians, can we admit something real quick and say, that's not how we're obedient to God. <laughs> I'm obedient to God when it's easy. I'm obedient to God when there's a benefit, right? Because a be I mean, obedience to God when there's a benefit is simple. It's like, yeah, God, I'll do this. It's good for me. And we do this in so many areas of our life all the time, right? God, I will be a good Christian kid. I I'll, I'll do moral things. I, I won't swear much. I won't drink. Um, I'll, I'll come to events like these. I'll respect my mom, my dad, my teachers, all these things. We'll do, man, we'll do it all for God because it's, it's easy. It's simple. But, you know, when God says, hey, I don't want you to have any sexual relations outside the covenant of marriage, ultimately because I created it, and that's what I designed it for, we're kind of just like, yeah, but you don't really mean that one, right? I mean, okay, God, I get it. It's a really good rule. It makes sense because, you know, it's, it's, you prevent STDs, unplanned pregnancies, all these things, and I think it's good moral rules for most people, but, like, I love her. Like, God, I'm a Christian. I mean, I love this girl, and I feel like she completes me. Uh, I feel like she's my soulmate. She makes me happy. And that's what love's about. Like, you want me to find love so I can be happy. And I found it. So you don't, you don't care if I bend your rule here, do you? Right? Or how about the real Christian thing to do? I'm a Christian. That means sex is off the table. But everything else is on the table. Because me... I mean, oral sex with my girlfriend, that, that's, that's not the same thing, right? Me sexing my girlfriend late at night, that, I mean, I could be doing such worse things, and, and I'm not really going against what God has asked me to do. Or how about me specifically? Justify, looking at pornography, hours on end. Somehow convincing myself, this is what a Christian kid should do. Because I could be sleeping around. I could be doing things with my girlfriend. I could be doing all these things. But I'm going to do this in the privacy of my room that nobody else knows about. And, and, and God, God gets this. He understands me in this one. And it's just, it's, it's not as bad. 
here's my question for us tonight, is at what point do we sit here and say, who are we fooling? Like for real, I mean, I say that I love because I'm in this with you, but who are we fooling? Like we, we know that God knows everything. Like we, there's nothing we can hide from Him, and we can't pick and choose what area of our life He's Lord over. God isn't the Lord of ever, everything in our life. If He's not Lord of anything, we don't get to pick and choose that. And so my challenge to us as Christians is can we stop the double standard in our life? You know which one I'm talking about. It's the one where we demand morality out of our culture, and yet we won't even follow God on the same principles He's laid out for us. How can we be light when we're just as dark? How can we judge our sinner friends, yet never examine the sin in our own heart? Because listen to me, if tonight we can sit here and we can justify sin. And then look, I'm not talking about struggling with sin. We're going to struggle with sin to the day we die. That's a biblical truth. I'm asking, can we justify it? Can we sit here tonight and say, God, I know I shouldn't be doing this. But I could be doing worse. God, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but, but look at her, look at him. They're in my youth group. They're not, I mean, they're doing things I wouldn't even do. Man, if we can really, if that's really what our heart says, then man, we can call Christ a lot of things. We can say he's a good moral teacher, best inspiration of our life, but we cannot call him Lord. Listen to me, we cannot call him Lord because he isn't. We are. We're the ones telling ourselves what we can do and what we can't do, what's good and what's right. And my challenge is that we're better than this. Guys, I know what I'm saying is hard to hear. And I know that outside of those doors, not a single person in this culture thinks you want to know this or thinks you want to hear this. Teenagers don't care. But I know what I'm hearing, or I know that what I'm saying you're hearing. And I know that what I'm saying is resonating because I was in your seat. And I know what it's like to be challenged in an area of my life that I wasn't holding the right standard. Because that's what tonight is about, this new standard. Man, it's a standard God set out a long time ago. But can we actually raise that bar in our lives? And <laughs> say, I'm done conforming to what this culture says sex looks like, what my life should look like. I'm done doing that. I'm going to actually follow God in every area of my life. That's what tonight is about. Guys, are we going to do that? Because we have no right to call ourselves Christians if we're not willing to follow God in, the, in the, just the, the life He's laid out for us. Man, can we do this? I know we can. The question is how, right? What do we do? Well, look, we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the show. So thank you guys so much for listening to me. I'll see you guys a little bit later.